scripture study. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy and righteous Father, we are so thankful for the wonderful blessings you give to us. We are so thankful, Father, for uh, your son Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done for us. We have been reminded this quarter about your kindness, about your mercy, about your love, about your grace. We are thankful, Father, that we are your people, that you have redeemed us and that you have lavished us with your, with your grace and love. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful blessings you've given to us, you have given to us. Thank you, Father, for the members that meet here, the family that we have here at West Main. You have blessed us tremendously in 2019. We look forward to great things in 2020 as your people. Help us, Father, to continue to remember who we are, never to forget the wonderful blessings you give to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so in a couple of weeks, we'll be starting our new Bible classes. On Sundays, we will have uh, two classes available for the adults in the auditorium. Zach Kelsey will be um, teaching the Gospel of Mark, and so that will be here in the auditorium. Uh, And then Tim will be teaching in the back, One Heart, One Soul, examining the one another passages in the Bible. And so those will be our two Bible classes on Sundays. Then on Wednesdays, I'm going to be teaching a class from the book of Genesis. And this class is actually going to go six months. So we're going to be in the book of Genesis for two quarters. And we're going to take our time as we walk through the book of Genesis. So I'll be teaching that on Wednesdays uh, in 2020. So that will cover uh, the first two months or the first six months of, uh, of 2020. So that's the lay of the land. So if you have your Bible, open it up, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, Wade introduced this uh, chapter to us. Uh, this past week or last week, and so we need to wrap up this uh, this chapter here uh, and get into Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, I had the opportunity, I read just the entire book of Ephesians. Something good to do sometimes is read the book out loud. It took about 17 and a half minutes. Something that's interesting, when you read out loud sometimes, you'll pick up on some other thoughts or themes that you find throughout the book. If you recall back in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul began this letter And one of the thoughts that he has immediately in this book is uh, the love of God. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy, uh, holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. What's interesting, when you get to the last part of Ephesians chapter 6, if you want to turn over there quickly, Paul is going to end this letter as he talks about, as he talks about, he talks about love. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 23 and 24, Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ, with incorruptible love. So it's interesting how he began the book talking about God's great love. And we've seen that through those first three chapters. And also he's encouraging and reminding us of the love that we should have for our Father in heaven. So if you turn back to Ephesians chapter 5, what I want to do, let's just start in verse 1. We'll quickly make our way through. We want to answer every question. We'll kind of summarize those first 21 verses because we'll have to continue to move on. What's interesting, when you get to chapter 5, it's a continuation of thoughts from uh, chapter 4. And here he's talking about love. And so the title of the, of the, of the class is, is Walking Worthy. He continues to talk about this idea of the walk that we are to have. He says in verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. So this is who we are supposed to be. We are to be following our Father in heaven. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you, and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So again, he reminds us about the love of God, the response that we should have because of the great sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 3 and 4, he says, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather given of thanks. Because of this walk that we are supposed to have, there is to be a change, a distinction, a difference. And so we do not walk uh, with respect to immorality, impurity, or greed, yet we rather have this giving of thanks. And so our speech, our conduct, there is to be this change, this difference. 
And he really emphasizes this point here. It made me think about, uh, if you recall, Phil Robertson's gospel meeting back in April. He talked about one pure light and the emphasis of us being light uh, in the world. And he talked about this behavior. He said in verse 5, For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So he emphasizes the importance of this walk that we are supposed to have. There are obviously ramifications with it. Let no one, verse 6, deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And so he makes it very clear. The ramifications of how we are to walk, what we are to avoid, we are not sons of disobedience. He says, therefore, be, do not be partakers uh, with them. That's the idea of participating. And what's interesting, when you go back to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, you see this word partake uh, being used here. He says, to be specific, in Ephesians 3 and verse 6, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's where our focus needs to be. That's who we are, uh, who we are in Christ. And so he makes it very clear, you don't partake with them, for you were formerly darkness, and that sounds like, Ephesians chapter 2, remember what he said there? How you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's who you used to be. So he says you were formerly darkness, but now, so here's this change. Uh, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So you see this distinction in verse 6. Sons of disobedience. This is what they have to look forward to, the wrath of God. Now he's emphasizing here in verse number 8, you are children of light. And when you think of this idea, he uses light and darkness quite a bit. Are there any uh, sayings or teaching of Jesus that, that kind of makes you, or when you read this kind of made you think about Jesus or some of the things that he taught? The, the I am's, I am, the, the light of the world. That's, what, that's where my mind went back to, to John chapter 8. You see this idea of light being used even by the prophets in the Old Testament uh, quite a bit. And so this, this contrast of darkness and light, you walk as children of light. And what's the result? What should we be bearing? What kind of fruit should we be bearing as children of light? What does he go on to say? Well, it's not going to be like the sons of disobedience. And that's, you know, you can look back in verses 3, 4, and 5. Where that's not the kind of fruit that we bear but rather goodness and righteousness and truth. And very similar to Galatians chapter 5 with the fruit of the Spirit. And so this change that we have, uh, going back to chapter 4, we have learned Christ. This is who we are. This is our walk. This is who we are supposed to be. And I love verse 10 where he says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So think about our motivation, and think about even as we go into 2020, you know, our, our motivation, our goal, our aim is to walk in love as our Savior has, to be imitators of God and, our, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and, and trying to be pleasing to the Lord, learning uh, to be pleasing to God, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And so that's where our mindset needs to be. And remember, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 3, and this is important, as Paul reminded them, the revelation that he had concerning this mystery of how God was going to, and, you know, how Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs uh, in the body of Christ. Remember he said in Ephesians 3, and verse 3, 4, and 5, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. And so there's something powerful there with respect for us reading, listening, uh, and, and taking seriously what the apostles and prophets have given to us in the word of God. Uh, we, this is how we can learn to be pleasing to God. This is how we can know, and as he's going to say later on, that we walk redeeming the time circumspectly carefully right and so this is the significance of that revelation that we have so that we can be pleasing to God he makes it very clear in verse 11 do not participate and I have a line going from verse 7 to verse 11 do not be partakers then he says again in verse 11 do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness so again you see this 
this light in verse number 8 and verse number 9, and this darkness again in verse number 11. But instead, I'm reading from the New American Translation, even expose them. So uh, we don't participate in this kind of life. That's who we used to be, Ephesians chapter 2. You were formerly in this darkness, but now there's a change. And so going back to what he said earlier uh, at the beginning of chapter 5 and earlier in the book as well. Uh, And he goes into more detail, and really this is powerful when you think about it. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. And so we, we don't take pleasure in those deeds of darkness. And that's the battle sometimes, right? Where, um, and he's going to emphasize this quite a bit in chapter 6. We have an enemy, right? We are in this spiritual battle. But he's reminding us we are children of light, uh, not sons of disobedience. And so we don't engage in that behavior. That's not who we are anymore. Uh, we've, been, um, we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Um, There seems to be some kind of illusion here going back. There's a lot of references, and it's interesting how often Paul would quote from Isaiah. There seems to be some illusion with some some of this language here from the book of Isaiah. Um, and so, again, he's just emphasizing, you know, this is who we are. This is, you know, we used to be in that life, that conduct, but we no longer are. And so he says in verse 15, therefore, be careful how you walk. So that's, that's this theme that we find. Going back to chapter 5 and verse number 1, he says, be careful, verse number 2, how you walk. You walk in love. Back in chapter 4, he said, you walk in truth. So you be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. So that was one of the questions, I believe, this not but, right? These contrasts that's going on. So we walk carefully, not as unwise men, but as wise. And we can know the wisdom of God. We have God's revelation. We have this recorded for us by the apostles and prophets. That's going back to Ephesians chapter 3. So verse 16, making the most of your time. Because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish. Here's another not but construction. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And I think that's a very important thought. We can understand God's will. We can understand what it is God desires for us to be pleasing to him, as he said back in verse 10, that we can know God's will for us and how he wants us to live and how we conduct ourselves and how we walk. So he says, You make the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And in verse 18, I think it's just continuing this thought. And do not get drunk with wine. Do not get drunk with wine. And you can also say, obviously, don't even start the process. Uh, Do not get drunk with wine. He's going to make a comparison here. And just doing some more reading on this, obviously, you know, Wine and drunkenness, you know, was a feature of uh, idol worship, um, and obviously it was a big societal problem during this time, just as it is today. So he says, you don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So he's making this contrast of what you should be under, what kind of influence you should be under, not with wine, but rather under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And that influence will come through the words of the Holy Spirit that we have that have been recorded for us. And so as he talks about making the most of our time, it becomes really important that we take seriously these words here that he's emphasizing uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to our walk, when it comes to our conduct, when it comes to our lives. So uh, we went through that kind of quickly, but let me just stop here and pause. Are there any comments or questions uh, from that section before we move forward? Comments or questions? Yes, sir. The first thing we're doing is we're not imitating another human being. We're not taking a stand from human being. We're not taking a stand from our peers, from a uh, you know, brother that you put on a trust in, from someone else. You're putting your trust and your leadership and your imitation, therefore, in God. That's who's your invitation.
And so a lot of times what we're helping them to understand here is that we can get very comfortable in our own perspectives. Let's forget about our perspectives. And let's start focusing on God's perspective. Mm -hmm. Who am I really reflecting here? And I live here belonging to Christ. Mm -hmm. Who is which whose reflection am I showing? Am I showing my reflection? Society's reflection? Yeah. Or God's reflection? Yeah. As we sojourn here, because we're sojourning, mm -hmm. we're just passing through. Sure. Your preparation here is for the life to come when you leave God for all eternity. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the standard should always be uh, our Father. Uh, the standard should always be um, Jesus Christ. And that just made me think about uh, uh, James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, um, where, you know, Paul would say uh, in James chapter 1 and verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. And so we have this standard, right? So we can see and know how it is. We are to, to follow in the footsteps uh, of God. There was another thought that I had, too, just kind of thinking about that. I'm trying to remember um, where it is. And you're absolutely right that the standard... Um, should always be our Father in heaven. Uh, I want to say it's uh, uh, in uh, Philippians chapter 4, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, correctly. I'm just kind of going off the cuff here. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So, the Father and the Son are always our standard, and yet I think that's a powerful thought, too, that Paul was imitating them in such a way that he could say, "You, the things you see in me, you, you follow down that same path as well. So, obviously, he was not the ultimate standard, but I think that says something about the light of his life and how he could say, you imitate me as well. And there's something powerful for us uh, as we talk about parenting here in chapter 6. There's a great example for us where you think about the wisdom that we have in the book of Ephesians and the word of God and how we can give that to our children, how we can plant these seeds to our children and how they can begin to imitate us uh, as we imitate our, our Father in heaven. So uh, great thoughts with that. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, so let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 and we're going to read through uh, chapter 6, verse number 10. So look at verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with melody and making melody with your heart to the Lord. And certainly uh, that is something we are to follow and that is our authority today as we, uh, as we worship uh, in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs uh, from the heart, um, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. 
Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and, and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. Finally, I'm sorry, we'll have to stop there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. We'll have to stop there. All right, so let's look at these questions here. We're on lesson 11, um, page number 45. Uh, there are 13 questions here, and some of these we can go through a little bit faster than others. There's lots of thoughts. So um, let's just talk about this here real quickly as well. Uh, reading this, and we can look at the first couple of questions here. Um, what was your thought as you read this? What, obviously, what is Paul trying to get out uh, about what this section, what's he, what's he teaching here? Uh, what would you say this section is all about? Real quickly here, anyone want to share? Go ahead. Submission and service. Sub okay, submission and service for others. You certainly see that relationship. Anyone else? Uh, yes, sir. That's a good point. Yeah, uh, to the Lord, as to the Lord. Good. Uh, anyone else? Any other thoughts? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Yes, sir. He's talking about marriage, too. Well, we certainly learn a lot about the husband-wife relationship in marriage, and, and we're all... How the church. Yeah, and we're going to see the great love uh, of Christ uh, for, for, for the church as well. And so um, when you go into this section here, he certainly is emphasizing here... Uh, the idea of um, subjection, and uh, that's, that leads to the second question, words, phrases, ideas, concepts repeated in the text. Uh, there, there's quite a few here. Um, the idea of being subject to one another, he begins that thought in verse 21. Uh, husbands, wives, uh, love is a big theme, and this is a powerful text when it comes to leadership, when it comes to husbands and how we treat our spouses. Uh, which, you know, what he's teaching us here, the example of Christ, certainly would have been way different than what they saw and would have experienced during that time and, and uh, when this was written. And even, even for today, you know, this is powerful for us uh, to consider. So any other thoughts or uh, ideas or concepts uh, that, that stood out to you uh, as you read these verses here? Any other thoughts, comments? Go ahead. Sure, yeah, and, and what Paul does in Ephesians, he really emphasizes, um, not that he doesn't do it in other places, but we, we see, you know, the significance of, of, the, of the church, the body, um, in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll talk more about that, how Christ is head over all things, and all things have been made subject to him, and so uh, as we start thinking about this idea of of, of subjection, it's not something that he's just now uh, emphasizing. Uh, you remember back in Ephesians chapter 1, that's what he said in verse 22, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. And so again, he's going to bring up this idea uh, as you start thinking about subjection. And so question three, let's take a look at question three here. Um, and I think it's pretty straightforward. What command or commands uh, does this passage give to husbands and gives to wives? So we, we've already kind of touched on that. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Paul is um, obviously teaching us quite a bit about the husband-wife relationship. And uh, the parallel text, uh, if you want to describe it that way, is in Colossians. You look in Colossians chapter 3, it reads very similar to Ephesians chapter 5 here. And even like 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, you see... Uh, Paul, as he talks about the, the husband and the wife. So here he says to the wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, and, he, and he goes into why. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ also 
is the head of the church. And so the two big thoughts or themes here uh, is the idea of subjection and love. And so just looking up this word subject, um, using the Blue Letter Bible, uh, it says this word is a Greek military term meaning to arrange troops or divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. In non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in or cooperation, assuming responsibility, or and carrying a burden. Um, we know that Paul has, in other places, talks, talked about the idea of subjection. Uh, you think about Romans 13 and verse 1, being subject to, uh, to the governing authorities. And so here, again, uh, he's going to talk about this idea uh, of wives being subject uh, to their husbands and husbands loving their wives. Now, question number four uh, leads us into a, a good thought where the author of this material asks, uh, why do you think God gives these instructions and how, how are they difficult to obey? How'd you guys go about answering that question there? Okay, so there are some different, <laughs> yeah, so there are some things to think about when we start thinking about men and women. Um, so what else? Why do you think God gave these instructions? So you, your answer is kind of why this may be a little bit difficult. Um, what other thoughts do you guys have? Any other thoughts? There are many challenges in marriage. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there certainly are many challenges in marriages, and certainly there is a structure that we see um, that that should be that we should have in our marriages. Did you have a comment, sister? Yeah. yeah, the comment was made from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter gives uh, instruction for the husbands and for the wives as well. And, and both wives and husbands play a very powerful role in the marriage. Wives, as he said in 1 Peter chapter 3, again, he uses this idea of submissions. Be submissive to your own husbands. Uh, even that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word uh, by the behavior of their, of their wives. And he also says to the husbands in verse 7, you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. So there's a lot of powerful thoughts there. One, he's not downgrading women or anything like that. Two, he's helping us to see that women or wives are fellow heirs, those in Christ, fellow heirs of the grace of life. So that certainly says something about the relationship and how a husband should view his wife. And then three, he says, let me tell you how important this really is so that your prayers may not be hindered. And so I think part of the challenge that we have, and certainly even then during that time, uh, is society and um, taking our cues from people around the from people in the world. Uh, Dane mentioned the point: our the one we should be imitating is God. So He is the standard, and that has been a challenge throughout the centuries, right? Of the role uh, and what we do find there is a role in the home. Uh, you know, the husband is the head of the wife, uh, even as Christ is head of the church. And man was made first, as you go back to Genesis chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 2. So I think part of the challenge is sometimes, um, unfortunately, there are bad situations and, and poor men and poor leadership. Uh, and certainly people, I think, have probably even abused some of these passages as well, this idea of submitting. Uh, but when you compare it to what he's saying here, and you think about the love that Christ has for the church, um, and how husbands are to love their wives in this manner, uh, it really is going to go a long way with our marriages uh, being great uh, and, and being the kind of marriages that they really should be. Um, I would also say, too, that uh, pride often is one of the biggest issues or one of the biggest challenges in marriages. Um, selfishness, uh, you can just look at a, a Philippians chapter 2. Um, that certainly is, I think, you'll always see that when there are marital problems as well. So what the Bible says, and think about this wisdom uh, and these instructions and this structure that we have in the Word of God. Uh, this is, this is, this is the, the one that we need to be listening to. Uh, this is the standard that we need to be following. Uh, 
And even think about our families and our homes and how that can be such an influence upon people in the world where they see we are submitting to God's standard, God's will. And so it's not about downgrading or belittling anyone or anything like that. But there is this reverence, there is this respect of God's authority uh, with how our houses are, are to be. I was going to say, I think what makes it difficult is selflessness. Because Christ was the ultimate example of selflessness. Uh, selflessness and what he did come here to serve for us. And if we're going to be the proper husband, we have to lead in a selfless manner. It requires a selflessness on the wife's part as well. Yeah, so. yeah and, and, and the devil knows how to disrupt and to turn everything around that's what you saw or that's what we see excuse me in the beginning uh where it says that adam was with eve uh you know so again these roles and these responsibilities so selfishness uh is certainly a, a major problem there as well yes sir i want to just echo brother chris's point because in verse 25 see husbands love your wife because christ also loved the church and gave himself for her so in essence you first see Christ setting an example. He didn't say I love you. He showed us how much he loved you. Yeah, yeah. Example first. So then in essence, I always have this whole section in verse 21, because verse 21 says, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. He first showed us love so that we now, when we appreciate such love, it becomes easy to subject yourself to somebody who loves you so much and done so much for you. So in essence, if you as the husband is doing that, you're making it so much easier for your wife to just fall in suit. That's what Christ did. <laughs> it's just like yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That's right. Now, the men see is like that's what the marriage is about. That's right. That's right. And that's why it's such a powerful, I think, example when we truly buy into God's pattern. And, and God's will and walking in love and truly embracing this idea uh, of what that's going to be. Yes, sir. I remember where it was. When I, it was I, I wrote it down in my margin. It's over in First Timothy 2. But there were writings by a man named Seneca the Younger about this progressive movement called the New Woman. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty well started by the Caesar and certain laws of the past. And basically it permitted women to not only take men's roles, but to be very provocative and to almost like the first century version of the 1920s and since in this country, where he's talking about in chapter two, talking about how women should adorn themselves with physical apparel and not doing all these things, but doing that which is proper for women to possess godliness. And I kind of <coughs> that that as perhaps part of what he was telling the Ephesians too, because they're right in the middle of a Roman world. Yeah, it's going to go against the grain. Affected just like it can be affected mm -hmm. by outside influences, whether you want to talk about laws that were passed and mm -hmm. encouraged by the Caesar back in the first century, mm -hmm. or the idea of whether it's women's liberation or any of those other types of things that could provocative or appeal to our carnal side sure. and it's just it's not what God had in mind we have roles to play and he's really I think maybe part of that play is yeah absolutely look this is going to go you know uh, and even what he says later on you know this again you know God's design is always is always going to be the best way and it's our responsibility to buy into it to trust him and uh, what Dane said, that kind of takes us to the next question, uh, and this idea of trusting, what does this text teach us about our value to Christ? You think about what Christ has done for the church, and just the language that he used here, uh, that Paul uses in uh, verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So passages like Acts 20 and verse 28 come to mind, and Mark chapter 10 uh, Jesus talks so much about being this servant and this sacrifice or being sacrificial. And that's certainly um, who he was and, and what he's done for us. And so these passages here really help us to understand, one, uh, the value of who we are in Christ and uh, 
uh, words like nourishes and cherishes. Uh, those really, I think, indicate, again, this love um, that he has for his people as well, and that he has for, uh, for the church. And so uh, you see this act of love. It was more than just lip service. There was action uh, behind it. And that's where, when you go back to the cross, again, that's what you see. You see this action and love. Uh, you see great examples of, of leadership uh, as well. And so these verses here really go a long way, and certainly we could talk a lot more about them. But I think one point of application to make here, um, you know, you can look at a lot of different things and look at society and things like that. But for those of us who are married, as husbands, we should ask ourselves, okay, you know, how might I else improve with respect to, to my, love, my love to my wife? Um, and where else do I need to grow with, with my love? And that can be really challenging. I know 1 Corinthians 13 is, is talking to brethren with how we love, but there's, there's great application for us. And for, for wives, there is this struggle at times. And I think that goes back to Genesis chapter 3, this idea of, of Eve and this desire shall be for her husband. Um, but where else might you be able to uh, subject yourself and honor your husband and respect your husband? And so... You can re- we can really bring this home to our families, to our situations. Um, you know, I, we were just looking at some things. Uh, I go through these moments where I just kind of go like through memory lane, and I found, uh, uh, what was that thing I found, Nikki? Um, oh, the, the reveal party uh, with whether or not we're going to have a boy or girl. And, uh, you know, looking at where it was and things like that. And it was at this couple's house, and they're no longer married. And, you know, you know, I think back to all these things like, okay, what happened? You know, they're in worship services every week. Uh, he's one of the deacons. So what happened to the love? Where's the love? Where's the marriage? So we can hear all of these things, but the application is, is great and it, at times very challenging. Love can be, you know, sacrifice. Uh, that in and of itself can be challenging. So what Paul is saying here, uh, and there's much more we could say, but what he's saying here is powerful. I didn't want to overlook it, but somebody have a comment? I've got to move a little bit. Uh, okay. So let's look at the next question here. You could do an entire class on this uh, and, and break that down here. Question number six. So Paul, as he continues on in Ephesians chapter 5, and we read all of this, he said in verse 32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And, you know, this passage here certainly does help us to see uh, the love of Christ uh, and again, this word mystery has been used throughout the book in chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 5 here, and even in chapter 6 and verse 19. But this relationship, uh, this love that Christ has for his people, and it's, it is really something to, to ponder and, to, uh, and just to uh, rejoice over. He says, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and there's another standard, love your wife as you love yourself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So there's responsibilities for both. So in chapter 6, and this leads us to this question here, Paul is going to talk about children and parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So, um, question six and question seven kind of go hand in hand here. Um, why do you think God gives these instructions? And since we don't have a lot of, uh, well, we have a lot of parents in here, so let's, let's get some thoughts from the parents. And this is really um, question seven, eight, and nine. Uh, give me some thoughts real quickly here about God giving these instructions and uh, the motivation that we should have when it comes to teaching our children uh, and leading them the proper way. What, what thoughts stood out to you um, from these verses here uh, when it comes to parenting and children? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think it's 
Yeah, show and tell, that's a great point. And um, I did a sermon called uh, uh, Children Do Your Job. Uh, so there are instructions for children. Uh, Paul does not leave them out. So you think about these uh, relationships that he's emphasizing. Um, I was thinking about question number 10. What temptations do fathers face in child training uh, and how can these be overcome? So we have a series of, uh, of um, uh, parenting um, studies on our website uh, that you guys can share on social media and look at. But real quickly here, we only have a couple of minutes, and I'm a father, so uh, you guys, you men, help me out here. Uh, what temptations do fathers face in child training? How'd you guys answer that question? We've got to move fast here. So I want to hear from some of the men real quickly. How'd you guys answer that? Or if you didn't answer it, just thinking off the cuff, what temptations do fathers face in child, in child training? Yes, sir. One thing that comes to my mind is all sorts of distractions, jobs, hobbies, just things that keep us occupied, not really spending enough time training and uh, focus on our children. But also I think there's a temptation for us to train up our children to be like we are rather than as God would have us to be. You know, the, the things we're interested in, that's what we might want them to be interested in. We spend time with them. You know, and really we need to make sure we have a concerted effort to spend time with God's word. You know, personality and they take different paths in life, but the focus needs to be on, on pleasing God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the focus being on pleasing God, being in the word of God, uh, that's one of the points, too, to make the, the emphasis is upon parents and parents taking this responsibility, teaching their children. So we, we have Bible classes and things like that, but it's still the parents' responsibility. We're with our children every day. We know who they are. <clears throat> we know those challenges and those struggles as well. I always think about how when these letters would be read, you know, after they were delivered and how the children in the audience, I wonder, did they perk up when they, when they heard when they when they heard it being read, children obey your parents, and how there's instructions even for them. And so uh, we had a class this year on parenting, um, and a really great class and a lot of great feedback, and uh, it's something that we all need to help one another out with. So Paul concludes, or at least in this section, in verses 5 through 9, where he talks about the slave-master relationship. Um, and I have some additional notes here, um, and I can mention them. I guess I can raise my hand next, next Wednesday and uh, mention some of the extra notes that I have. But uh, in the workbook, it says the slave-master relationship of the Roman Empire was quite different from the slave-master relationship of what we are familiar with in more modern times. Typically, people became slaves either to work off a debt or as a result of a lost war. And with that said, what Paul is doing here, again, he's giving, he's giving instructions to these Christians, whether they are slaves or whether they are masters. And the instructions are really powerful, where he sums it up in verse number 9, to the masters, you do the same things to them, to give up threatening, which means that, that certainly that would, could be taken place, was taken place, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no partiality with him. And so, again, the standard has always been God in his way uh, in all the relationships. And so as we think about wrapping this up here, think about your relationships and making sure that in our relationships we are following the standard that God has given us. So we'll pick up the rest of chapter 6 and conclude next Wednesday. Thank you.